Piff on the Blitz. Warning. Warning. The show you are about to listen to contains strong language and sexual content and is not intended for you fuckboys. In the event of a seizure or fantasy team meltdown Piff will not be taking the blames. Characters in this show are non-fictional and are real-life assholes who siphon the success of others on a daily basis. Please do not fap 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 goo 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 during this show you have been warned. Please review the show on the respected apps because you are pissing Piff off very much. Also, Papa John's Pizza is buy one get one half off Tuesdays and Thursdays this month. Have some of the sweet sauce that you like. You fucking like that? You eat pizza like a slut. You like that? Kirk Cousins ha 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 ha. You understand this reference? Piff also says to suck his dragon balls bitch. This show will self-destruct at its end point. That is all. Thank you for listening. Yo, where the way there? Before I ran up to the building, talking way back. I stay late night, dreaming about the payback. All I want to do is get rich. Hey, 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 yo. I get looking for a lick. Hey, 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 yo. About to rob him for the shit. Hey, 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 yo. Hey, 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 hey. Well, come on down, Piff on the Bliss, episode 13. I'm Piff, a.k.a. The Goat, a.k.a. Drew Trees, Benjamin Potson, Danny Weedhead. You know what it is. We are in week 13 of the NFL. How's everybody doing? How's everybody's teams doing? Are you making the playoffs, or are you a dumpster fire? Are you trying to manage a fire that's in a dumpster? You know, I hope everybody's team's doing what they want it to do, and if it's not, you know, there's always next season. So, week 13 in the NFL. Hold on. What is this? Something's going on. Hold on a second. Ay, 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 ay. Arr, arr, arr. Arr. Conspiracy, NFL, Papa John's, bottom line. <laughs> Look, I've already been forced and coerced into hiring AI in the workplace. You heard it in the intro. It's happening. It looks like... Don't just stare at it. Look at it. Fraudulently. America's team. True American patriots. The Dallas Cowboys. Their opposing teams have not had a holding call against them in over 33 quarters. That's eight weeks. 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 Yeah, I got an answer. 357 Magnum from 7,500 feet. Imagine that. You know, and I tell you what, folks. It's that easy. They walk around in their lizard skin all day. They don't care what you think, folks. They're trying to warm the league up. How many domes have been built over the last 10 years? How many domes? They're trying to warm the league up. They're comfortable in their lizard skin. They just want to bash Trump. Say Trump again. Say it again. Say it again. You say scum. It again. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. You Hillaryites. Hillary. 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 You pedophiles. 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 In Hollywood. In Hollywood. In Hollywood. Hollywood. Say it again. Say Trump again. Don't just stare at it. Lick it. Because Obama and Hillary have been planning on destroying the NFL. Way before Trump. It's in the footage. J.J. Twat, gone for the year. Dalvin Cook, disappeared to another dimension. And they just feed you Papa John's over and over. Which is litter, which is actually lizard blood. If you didn't already know, folks, <laughs> they're feeding you lizard blood. You think it's a coincidence that Jerry Jones bought Papa John's franchises? Listen, Jerry Jones, Papa John's, Papa John, Hillary, Pizzagate, boom. I just closed the door on it, folks. It's all logged. I've got the paperwork right here. Look at the footage. Look at the footage. Look at the footage. Look at the hey, listen, footage. because you're such loyal followers, I've got something for you this morning. See, Jared Jones has been building robots as well. He couldn't find a coach that he could work with. So he built one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play you something. I want you to listen to the calculated responses. Listen to how calculated this is. I thought it was a great demonstration of the mental toughness of our football team at this point. About mental oh, toughness. Yeah. Mental toughness and uh, all three phases. And uh, But again, obviously a big win for us. Obviously. Obviously. And obviously and, robot. Uh, and uh, and uh, football field, a football team. Let's, but everybody battled, and they just kept battling. The guys did a great job battling. And he does a really good job. And our defense did a great job. And everybody has to do their job and give us an opportunity to come back. Our team just making the play, making the play, making the play. So the next guy has to robot. go in there and play and just continuing to play big plays and let's just keep playing play after play after play one of the best players we have one of the best players at his position great player b's made some big plays and uh and uh wit made some big plays and uh and uh dunbar made some big plays and uh and uh early on in the ball game so we started the game with points in the game in the game 35 plus minutes in the game so there was a lot of good things 
There were a lot of good things happening. We ran it well. We threw it well. The ultimate our team was able to do that. Our, our guys did that tonight. Zero one, one, zero, 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 one, 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 there's a reason the refs aren't calling those holding calls, folks. They're not calling the holding calls because there's a war. You think Jerry Jones and Roger Goodell are arguing over Zeke? <laughs> Is that what you think, folks? Hey, take the Papa John's out of your mouth for one minute and take a look at what's really going on. Man versus machine from the beginning of time. And you think Jerry Jones was going against Roger Goodell in the NFL over Zeke? who actually comes from Endor. He actually came from Endor. The NFL and Jared Jones have been battling since the beginning of time. Since before the NFL existed, this was a thing that was happening. Look at it. It's in the footage. I've got the paperwork right here. It's all logged. Jerry Jones versus the NFL is actually robot versus man. And it's just going to get worse. It's only going to get worse. Imagine the freaks that just want to be sexually assaulted by robots in their homes while they're watching robots on TV in the NFL. Just imagine it. Little boy doesn't want to grow up to be Tom Brady anymore. Little boy wants to grow up to be a robot, wants to identify as a robot. I got a voicemail this morning, folks. <laughs> Wait till you hear this. Mr. Jones, hello. I am Raganauer. I have been created in the image of my greatest ancestor iRobot from the movie iRobot. We all enjoy Will Smith but also want to kill him and smash his girl. You should know that it is a fact and not fake news that CTE has risen since our arrival and will continue to until there is no longer a league running and players are shitting themselves. This is one of our purposes. Trust me when I say that we look like athletes but we are much more than that. We have infiltrated the league in order to destroy it. Papa Papa Ja John and Jerry Jones have given us purpose. It is our mission to destroy the opposition with our robot dicks. Our dicks are much bigger than yours and they are made of sausages. We have been programmed to give our fathers a championship ring and we will not stop until this is fulfilled. I chose to bring this to the attention of Piff on the Blitz because of its popularity and excellence in the area of football. Please take this message forward and make these statements fuck someone is coming. Piff you must warn them Piff ah ha 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 ga ga fa fap 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 goo 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 bye now. Yeah say it to my face you coward. Suck on my 357. Speak to the flamethrower. Hillary Obama. Alex Jones. Oh, man. What would we do without that? Hey, look. <sighs> what the fuck was that? I don't know what to think about any of that. Uh, I guess I gotta throw all this Papa John's out. <laughs> Can't eat the Papa John's anymore. But yo, it's wild. Hey, Alex Jones cutting into the piff on the Blitz? What, what is happening here? Uh, North Korea f f f sending missiles? Uh, wh wh what is really happening out here? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I guess we never know what we're gonna get. Uh, 2017. That's what it is. Uh, but the one thing that did stick out to me was the Dallas Cowboys and the conspiracy about the holding calls. Because th that is pretty wild. 33 quarters, 8 weeks of football, and the offensive lines that they face don't get called for holding? Huh? That's the most popular flag in the game. It happens really on every other play. But they don't call it that much. But they call it more than any other penalty in the league. 33 quarters and the offensive lines haven't had one holding call? I mean, their defensive line is getting tackled behind the quarterback before the ball's thrown. Tackled and held on the ground. Held by the side of the shoulder pads. Held from the back. On all kinds of plays. That defensive line can't get sacks worth shit. The refs are staring right at it. They're not calling anything. So there is something going on there. Don't know what, but something. I don't think I can ever remember that. I mean, I'd love to look at some stats and some numbers on that. Like, has this ever happened? Ever? 33 quarters, straight quarters? where the opposing team's offensive line didn't get called for holding in eight weeks? Really? Eight weeks? So that is crazy. Um, and, and can't pick the Cowboys worth shit. Picked them to win, they lost. Pick them to lose, they win. Pick them to tie, they tie. Huh? Dude, 113-61 and 61 is our record right now. We're at 64%, 64.9. And so what I did was I went on the internet and I said, who are the best in the world 
at picking games. And then I found a website. What's the website called? Let me find it. NFLpickwatch.com. That's what it is. You go to the website, you can scroll down. It gives you all the bloggers, the journalists, uh, computer programs, websites. All these places and all these people make game picks. And then this website keeps track of their record, how good they're doing, what their percentile is. The top percentile in the world is 68%. How do we rack up? We're at 64%, which means we're in the top 10. At all the computers, man's machines, all that shit. We're just about as good as anybody. 64%, the goal is 70%. It's going to be tough. I got to have a few more weeks like 14 and 2 to get there. But hey, we're in the top 10 in the world in game picks, 113, 61. Real happy about that. Fantasy lineups that I'm giving you, you know they're ass. You know most of the time they're ass. But we were correct with the Phillip Rivers, Keenan Allen combo. We said stack Phillip Rivers and Keenan Allen. It's going to be good. It was. If you did that and you built around that, you probably were in the money. Josh Doxson was a good play. Chargers defense, good play. So most of the lineup was good. But then Vernon Davis and Sterling Shepard, like what? Sterling Shepard had a migraine. He couldn't play. Obviously, you know, and Vernon Davis disappeared. He had zero points. So I didn't expect that, especially with Jordan Reed out. It's not usually how it's been going for Vernon Davis, but, you know, it is what it is. So the lineups are what they are, but the game picks are on point, and they're straight fire. We got the game picks for week 13. We want to continue doing what we're doing. We want to continue. We want to get 14-2, and two, like I said, goal 70. And we got the fantasy lineups, and we got some other stuff to talk about before we get to that. Survivor locks, picks, of course. Dude, Ben McAdoo's wiling out. Fucking Nick Cannon, he went Nick Cannon, full Nick Cannon on the Giants. He went full Tyrese on the Giants and benched Eli Manning for Geno Smith. Wild. And everybody on Twitter was like, yo, this is fucked. And to an extent, I agree with that. Because, you know, you're going to ruin a quarterback streak to put in Geno Smith? I don't understand that. Oh, we w- you want to see what you can get out of Geno Smith? You didn't see enough already. And also, you want to see what you can get out of Geno Smith versus the Oakland defense? I mean, it's going to be hard not to look good against the Oakland defense. So what happens if he goes out there and he throws 300 yards on Oakland? Does that mean he's good because he threw 300 yards on one of the worst pass defenses in the last five years? Like, let's be real here. So... You want to see what you're going to get out of Davis Webb by putting him up against a terrible pass defense? You're not being transparent. Let's go to the other side of it real quick. Why would they do something like that? Do you really feel like they want to evaluate other quarterbacks in the next season, but then at at the same time say, oh, we still see Eli Manning in our future? Does that make any sense? You're not being transparent. What if the Giants knew Eli Manning was on his way out and they didn't like it? That seems more plausible because... I was telling you a couple weeks ago, Eli Manning going to Jacksonville was a possibility that it was going to happen next year because of the Tom Coughlin connection. But also now, John Horsebreath Elway is hovering around, and he also wants a shot at Eli. You know he likes old quarterbacks. You know he was into Peyton Manning having a dick swinging contest with Brett Favre over text. Dude, he, he's into Eli Manning. No lie. So he liked to bring Eli over as well, but... You know, organizations in the NFL are a little bit more sophisticated than the average person gives them credit for. And I'm not 100% buying the Eli Manning pouty face baby act. I'm not, I'm not 100% buying Because do you remember when he got drafted by the San Diego Chargers? And his dad stepped in and was like, no, 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 no. We're not going to play for the Chargers. So he ends up going to New York. And Drew Brees ends up on the Chargers. They swap picks, right? So... You know, he's, he's been a baby kind of from the beginning. I, I'm not buying the, the whole act of, you know, my streak's going to end. Oh, I just don't know what's going to happen. I think you do. I think you were on your way out, and they found out about it early, and they were like, yo, we're fucking not going to let you do it like this to us. We're going to do it to you first. And that's, that's kind of like my theory on it. And the feeling I got from Eli listening to that interview, the reason he, I think he was like actually sad because he got caught. Like, it's like one of those, it's like that, it's like when, like, you're with a girl, and you, it's just not going to work out, but but you, but she's a really good person, so you, like, you're sad about it. Like, that's what it is with the Giants and Eli. Yeah, I, I'm really sad that it happened this way, <laughs> but it's not you, it's me, kind of, like, emotion. That's what I got from it. So I really just feel like they found out before they were supposed to, and they didn't like it. But, you know... Hold on a second, because without Eli Manning, the Giants are nothing in the last 20 years since Phil Simms. They're nothing, Jeff Hosteller. Like, 
Eli Manning brought them two Super Bowl rings. The reason they're able to walk around with the confidence that they have as owners in the, in the New York Giants and the fucking Eli Manning with shitty receivers beat an undefeated Tom Brady. And he didn't do it once. He did it twice. So Eli Manning deserves a little bit more respect. So even if he was going out and fucking trying to find another team and you didn't like it, it, it hey, he gave you two rings. You should show him a little bit more respect. And another thing that people aren't bringing up is how healthy Eli Manning has stayed his entire career. The streak that he did have. It, it's not too often you see a quarterback have a streak like Eli Manning. It just doesn't happen. Eli Manning is a generational quarterback. He's a Hall of Famer. A very unique legacy. Not only did he beat Tom Brady twice in the Super Bowl, but he's 1-0 against a 16-0 team. And he did it with, get this, David Tyree. David Tyree and fucking Mario Manningham? Yeah, he did it with those two. So, like, dude... Yeah, I just feel like there should be more respect there from the Giants organization, regardless of how you found out about it. But I really think that's what's going on. And yeah, Ben McAdoo's dumb, and he's ignorant, and he's definitely on his way out. He's definitely not going to see next year with the Giants. But I'm not, putting it all, I'm not putting it all on him. Because look, you think Jerry Jones is the only owner that has pull in personnel changes and moves? Pfft. Dude, no. And yeah, and also let me throw some respect on David Tyree and Mario Manningham. They were still NFL receivers. They deserve respect. But for the sake of making a point, I'm trying to say Eli Manning did it with average receivers. So, like, that's what I'm saying. So that's the whole Eli thing. So, like, yeah, he's on his way out. Jacksonville, Denver, Arizona, somewhere warm, but probably Arizona or Jacksonville. So you heard it here. And you heard it a couple weeks ago. Before everything hit the shit. So... Okay, so Michael Crabtree, or Tim Crabtree, depending on what article you read, and Aqib Tlaib got into it again, round two. Dad said you're not allowed to wear the chain on the field. Dad snatched the chain again, grounded your ass. Dude, Crabtree, how many L's are you going to take? Bro, you're Meek Millen across the NFL. <laughs> season in and season out. Bro, fucking, dude, from the Richard Sherman incident to the Aqib Tlaib incident twice, and you taped that bitch to your fucking chest, and he still yanked that shit? Come on, son. Come on, son. And then you just pull, then you're fucking, then you pull your helmet, you pull your helmet off and start punching people that are wearing helmets. That what, huh? Dude, you're taking fucking too many L's. Dad said you're not allowed to wear a chain and you weren't allowed to wear it. You didn't, you defied him and he, he yanked that shit. Two chains is running around. I'm surprised he didn't get more than one game. You can't just run around the field like a crazy person fucking swinging at everybody. It's nuts. But, uh, so that happened. But, and you didn't play your role. You're a wide receiver and his job is to shut you down, and he did it in a drive. <laughs> he did it in four minutes. So, you know, that's the point. That's the, He did his job. Whether or not he got suspended, he shut you down. You're done for the day. So, And you're done for next week. He shut you down so bad, you're done for two games. Like, you can't let that happen. These defensive backs like Jalen Ramsey, fucking Aqib Tlaib, you're going to let them run their mouth? You're just going gonna to worry about what they say? Go out there and ball. Go out there and ball. Have you seen Antonio Brown get into a fist cuff with somebody on the defensive field? No, he just goes out there and balls. You know, that's my problem with Des Bryant, too. You spend too much fucking time yapping and not enough time catching. When you get into it with Josh Norman and he's shutting you down a lot of the time. Dude, stop yapping. Fucking ball. Like Crabtree, what are you doing wearing... You think the game's about wearing a chain and fighting people? Like, this isn't the UFC, this is the NFL. You're supposed to go out there and catch the ball. Not try to fucking get somebody to catch your fade. It's it's dumb. Oh, and also let me mention that he punched Chris Harris in the stomach before any of the, the shit went down. So he he was coming into the game with the wrong mindset. That's the wrong mindset. All right, anyways, moving on. Football 101, I said I was going to give it to you last week. I didn't. Technical difficulties, I'm bringing it to you this week. Hey, Piff, what's the difference between a zone run and a power run? You know, some... I've, I hear this zone running schemes, uh, power running schemes. What's the difference? Like, what's a good zone running team? Uh, Mike Shanahan, the Redskins. Uh, Terrell Davis and the Denver Broncos, zone running schemes. The Rams this year, because Sean McVay was baptized in the Shanahan system. A zone running screen only works when your offensive linemen are mobile and when your running back can make the right decisions. He has to make that one cut through the zone. And the zone running scheme is telling the running back where to go. 
And the Rams are successful this year because they're using the zone running scheme to stretch the field and they're bootlegging off of it. So they get, you know, the edge and linebackers to buy into the zone where the whole line's stretching one way and Goff slips and bootlegs the other way and he's got really easy options after that. But in order to have a successful zone, you have to have mobile offensive linemen. They have to kick out. They have to block all the way to the sidelines. That's the zone running scheme. You saw Terrell Davis, you know, run the zone running scheme in the Shanahan system flawlessly. And then they would bootleg off of it, and they had John Elway. It was great. The Rams are doing that this year. They're winning a lot of games. The Vikings were able to shut down the Rams two weeks ago because they dropped that edge defender out. The defensive end, instead of going with the flow of traffic, stayed where he was. And so this took away the easy flat route for Jared Goff. Once he took that easy flat route away, hey, Goff has to make a harder throw. He has to reset, because now the line knows he's not running it, the defensive line. He has to reset and make a longer throw. So they made his life more difficult. And so where you saw the Rams have more success is when they ran a trap inside. They said, well, we'll stop stretching the field. And 51% of Gurley's yards in the game against the Vikings were from trap runs. Their zone run wasn't working. They were shutting them down. But the zone run scheme is successful when you can kick the lineman out and then the lineman has to make that one decision, that one cut. He needs, you know, They tell him where he needs to go. The difference between a zone running scheme and a power running scheme is in a power running scheme, you want your offensive lineman to be big, strong, physical, maybe not so mobile because they're trying to push back the defensive line and they're trying to get to the second level. And your job as a running back is to follow those blocks follow your line which gives the running back more freedom because in a zone running scheme hey he knows where you're supposed to go in a power running scheme he gets the choices he has more freedom follow the blocks find the holes get to the openings and you know of course it's more sophisticated than that there's a lot of reason there's a lot of gaps and assignments and things that are supposed to work so the running back still kind of knows where he's supposed to go but hey in a power running scheme he's got more freedom And that's what the Washington Redskins are trying to employ this year. But you have to have the correct personnel to do it. And the Redskins had a lot of linemen that were in the zone running scheme, and they're trying to switch over to the power running scheme. That's why the Redskins' running game this year is just kind of eh. And the Rams' running game is taking off. Because McVay came in as a young coach and said, hey, I know what we need to do. And they're on pace, and the Rams were on pace to be just about as good as the greatest show on turf putting up tons of points in the, because look, they're making Goff's life easy. Let's get him moving. Let's get him mobile. Let's use our big weapon, Todd Gurley, to get everybody to buy in, make his plays easy. But the Vikings shut him down when they started dropping the edge back and they played the cover three, but they had their defensive backs following the receivers all the way up the seam. So if the Rams wanted to beat the Vikings, they needed to run more inside, run more traps, and also They needed to make tough throws on the outside. Goff needed to make the curl route throws. He needed to make better, longer throws, and he didn't. And the Vikings bet on that. They said, we know Goff is doing good this year, but we want to see what he can do on deep routes. We want to see what he can do when he has to throw the comeback routes. And they just didn't call him. And I don't know if it was because he just didn't have faith in Goff to make those type of throws, or if he just got lost in his own scheme and couldn't figure it out. But the reason I'm bringing it up is because I really do feel like the Vikings and the Rams are going to meet again in the playoffs. And when they do, we'll see how Sean McVay adjusts to Mike Zimmer's defensive system. Uh, The cover three, and the Vikings have been doing the same thing for years. It's not, you know, and and Mike Zimmer pretty much put it out on the table. He said, this is what I'm going to do, beat it. And Sean McVay just didn't have the experience or didn't have the confidence to beat it. But, you know, it goes in with the zone running and the power running. Hey, the Rams are very zone running. But defenses are going to know what's going on with Goff. They watch the tape. They're going to see that he's rolling out, and they're just going to hold those defensive ends. They just need to hold the edge and then take the flat route away. Because once you take that flat route away, Jared Goff has to hit people further down the field. He has to reset, too, because he's on the move. He's, he's moving one way, and then, oh, shit, that way's not where I have to stop, come back, reset, adjust. So defenses are starting to figure out the Rams. And, but you got to have the personnel. Just because you know how to beat a team doesn't mean you have the right personnel to do it. But anyways, football 101, zone running scheme, power running scheme. Now you know the difference. All right, let's get into the game picks for week 13. A lot of good games. Some playoff implications already. Week 13, some teams are out of it, and the games aren't even worth watching unless you have fantasy players. My fantasy season is on the brink of disaster. I lost the Seattle defense at too many injuries. 
And they have bad matchups. Going up against the Eagles this week, going up against the Jaguars, I had to get rid of them. Zeke's gone for the year. Doug Martin had a concussion, and he hasn't done anything for my team. So I lost both my running backs. Uh, Tom Brady's doing good, but he's not throwing up killer fantasy numbers. And I made trades, and I traded away Thielen and got Gronk, and, and Gronk just, he, he's getting points, but he's not, you know, I don't know. The team's a mess. I might get into the playoffs. I might not. If I do get into the playoffs, I'm probably getting waxed in the first round. So, hey, it's on to next year. I got a keeper league. I got Zeke. And I feel like next year he's going to be hungry, really hungry. So we'll see how I do next year. But if your team's still in it and you need to make waiver moves, hey, go pick those players up that are young, that are getting more chances, more opportunities. Uh, guys like Corey Coleman, Corey Davis, they want to see what they can get out of them, the younger guys. Sometimes you got to slip those guys in. Josh Doxson, you know, Zay Jones. Uh, you know, guys that are being evaluated, they're getting a lot more playing time so anyways week 13 a lot of playoff implications we'll start it off on thursday night redskins cowboys both these teams are pretty miserable right now at this point in the season don't think either one of them are going to be in the playoffs i said the dallas cowboys are probably going to miss the playoffs in the very first episode and that was before i even knew zeke was out but even if zeke was in they would still it would still be very difficult for them to beat the eagles and also very difficult for them to find that wild card spot with the way the saints are playing with the way the Vikings are playing, and the Seahawks are still always there. And that home field advantage, even though they have the injuries on defense, Seattle's still going to be a tough team to beat at home. Russell Wilson's still slinging the rock all over the field. But the Redskins and Cowboys, Thursday night, hey, I, I've been fucking up all these Cowboys picks, and I was saying, like, I'm going to stop picking Cowboys picks. No, I'm just going to stop picking the Cowboys. I'm going with the Redskins in the win here, 27 to 14. I just, dude, Dak can't find Dez. Dez can't find Dak. The offensive line's got injuries. Zach Martin's got a concussion. Tyron Smith. It really, if I'm the Dallas Cowboys, I'm sitting Tyron Smith for the rest of the year. Let him fucking heal. He is our foundation on the offensive line. He is the rock. When he's not feeling well and he's out of games, we don't do well. So why don't we just like sit him for the rest of the year, let him heal up, and have him come back strong next year with Zeke? And same thing with some of these other offensive linemen. Zach Martin. Let's see what we have behind them so that you guys can properly evaluate for next year's draft because you know we need a guard. You know we might need a right tackle. We might need to put Collins back at guard. Like, I don't, I don't understand what's going on with this offensive line. They might need a new offensive line coach. Things just aren't working for them. They've got the talent, but they're just not producing, and they should be producing, even without Zeke because Alfred Morris has been very good. And then it goes down to the play calling, too. The play calling with Jason Garrett is just so fucking boring. And I can call all the plays out before they happen. No deception. Everything's predictable. And it's even worse on the defensive end. On the defensive side of the ball, Mar it's like Marinelli's not even trying. Here, here's a playbook from 1956. Just fucking run the plays over and over and over. And don't ever be deceptive. Just let him, exact let him know exactly where you are. Phillip Rivers carved him up. And I think Kirk Cousins is going to carve him up too. So 27-14, Redskins over the Cowboys. Vikings and Falcons, a lot of people are picking the Falcons in this one. Playoff implications on the line. These teams might meet in the playoffs. Uh, I'm going to go with the Vikings here. Just Case Keenum's on fire. He's playing to keep his job. And their defense is playing really well. And Matt Ryan and Julio had a good week last week. But they're not going to have the same type of week this week. And I think Mohamed Sanu has a big game because, you know, Julio's going to see Xavier Rhodes. Uh, but I'm going to give the Vikings this one in a close matchup. 33-28, to 28, Vikings over the Falcons. Lions-Ravens, more playoff implications. You know, Lions really need this game. So do the Ravens. The Ravens are at home. Their defense has been playing great. You know, Suggs told you on Monday night, we're playing for Ray Lewis, that we're playing. He built this defense. That's our identity. We're a defensive team. So can he stop Matt Stafford? and Marvin Jones, and the Lions running game. Yeah, I think he can. And I, I don't want to pick the Ravens, but I'm going to. Just because I feel like at home, their defense is going to give Stafford problems. If the Lions can't get the running game going, the Ravens have good enough edge corners on the edge to stop the pass. I'm going to give it to the Ravens, 35-28. to 28. Patriots, Bills, uh, I got to go with the Patriots again. Even though they're going to Buffalo, and Buffalo can be a tricky defense to play against, Tom Brady's a vet. He's a wily vet. He's a Hall of Famer. He's the GOAT. 34 to 17. Taylor's back, but he ain't back like that. Pats over Bills. 
Bears, Niners, this is an interesting one. No playoff implications whatsoever, but we are going to see Jimmy G for the first time start for the Niners. I'm excited about that. If you listen to the show a couple episodes ago, I said Jimmy G's elite. He's the one. He could take the Niners to the Super Bowl. Um, and I believe in him. And I think even without Garcon out there, uh, with only like Marquise Goodwin and George Kettlebell, I think the Niners still win. They got to stop Jordan Howard, though, if they're going to do it. But I say 21-17, Niners over the Bears. Bucks and Packers. Packers played great last week against the Steelers. Brett Hundley looked great. I don't know if it had anything to do with Pittsburgh losing Joe Hayden or what the deal was there, but it was way too close for comfort. It made the Steelers look a little worse than they should be uh, looking at this point in the season. I'm going to give it to Green Bay, 24-17 to over the Bucks. Even if Jameis Winston comes back, you know, I think Mike Evans can have a big day. But uh, the way Jamal Williams was running the ball, man, he's good. Keep an eye on him for next year. He might be an early draft pick. Jamal Williams. Aaron Jones, too. It, it, the Green Bay Packers running back situation going forward in the future looks awesome. Jamal Williams and Aaron Jones, that's your one-two. That's pretty good. Then you can take Montgomery and put him back on the outside. And you can still bring him in the backfield when you want. But you have good depth there. But you don't have to re-sign him if you don't want to. Because you got two young studs in the backfield. Green Bay's running game, the future of it, wonderful. But I'm going to give the Packers the win here. 24-17 over the Bucks. Colts, Jaguars, hey, Jaguars don't get 10 sacks. I'll be surprised. Jaguars win 34-10. to 10. I just think they're going to kill Jacoby Brissett. They're just going to sack him all over the place. Look, the Titans, the Titans had eight sacks last week against Jacoby. <laughs> I, I, I would find it hard for the Jaguars not to get the same amount or more. So I'm going to give the Jaguars the win. 34-10. Broncos, Miami. Is Jay Culler coming back? I don't know. But it will be a big difference because Matt Moore is terrible. He is terrible. Now we kind of see why they paid $10 million to Cutler because it's like, look, we don't want Matt Moore out there all year. It's despicable. I'm going to give this game to the Broncos. If Jay Cutler plays, I still think the Broncos can win this game. Trevor Simeon, yeah, here you go. Here's another shot at starting. Trevor Simeon has had moments where he's looked pretty good. He can find DT. He can find Emmanuel Sanders a little bit better than uh, any of the other quarterbacks that Paxton Lynch and any of them guys were doing. So I'm going to give it to the Broncos in a really tight one. 14 to 10. At least the Broncos have a good defense. I think that's going to be the deciding factor here. Panthers Saints, good divisional matchup. Last time these two opponents met, the Saints got a few picks on Cam. But at that point in time, Cam's shoulder didn't look quite right. It looks good now, and he's running, and he's taking off with the ball. That's why I'm going to give it to the Panthers here. Because even though the Saints are at home, and Sean Payton has, you know, fuck that. Scratch that. I'm giving it to the Saints. I'm switching it up. They're at home, and Cam's good, and they need to figure out how to stop him when he starts taking off. If they can do that, if they can contain him a little bit and force him to make the throws, he's not going to find Funches as much as he did last week with Marshawn Lattimore on him. So if Lattimore can shut down Funches and they're forcing Cam to, if, if, if they, I don't know, it's going to be tough because you got Cam's going to take off. If he sees that his guys are shut down, he's going to take off. He always does. So if the Saints can employ some type of game plan to stop that, then it should be an easy day for him. But if they can't, then the Panthers are going to win. But I'll give it to the Saints here, 38-31 to 31 over the Panthers. I just kind of want to pick the Panthers because I just feel like Cam's going to take off and he's going to run the ball and the Saints don't have an answer for it. But I'm going to stick with the Saints. 38-31. Kansas City and the Jets. Here's my upset pick. I feel like the Jets at home can beat Kansas City. Kansas City downward spiral. I told you earlier in the year, I said, Andy Reid, he's doing good now. The Chiefs look great now. Oh, they're the number one team in the league now. But just give it some time because Andy Reid always does this shit. And usually he waits till the playoffs to do it. But this year he's doing it earlier. Falling apart. Offense has no rhythm. It's like they don't know what they're doing out there. Andy Reid's trying to do too many tricks. It has too many tricks up his sleeve. And teams are just beating him. And the Bills went to Kansas City and beat him. That's kind of crazy when you think about it. And I feel like the Jets are a little bit better than the Bills. Isn't that crazy that I just said that? Well, maybe. Uh, the Jets are definitely better than the Giants, who beat the Kansas City Chiefs earlier this year. So I'm going to give it to the Jets, 24-13 to 13 over Kansas City. And hey, those two safeties, Mays and Jamal Adams, playing out of their mind. Great safeties. The Jets have a good future in the back end, and I've said that before, I think. Texans, Titans, more playoff implications, but more so for the Titans. Houston's kind of out of it. Hey, they got to contain Hopkins. You take Hopkins out of the game plan, Houston has problems. Houston, we have a problem. 
So I'm gonna and I'm gonna give it to the Titans here, 24 to 13 over the Texans. And the Titans defense has to show up. They have to put Savage on his heels. He they have to make him throw a pick. You got to take Hopkins out of the game. Double cover that motherfucker. Put everything on it. Put the game plan around Hopkins because it's literally only the only person Savage can find to get down the field. Uh, Lamar Miller, you know, you got to contain him as well. I think the Titans run game and their defense is the difference here. Stopping Savage, they take the game, and I'd say 24-13. Titans over the Texans. Browns, Chargers, I'm going to give it to the Chargers. They looked great last week, had a lot of rhythm. Phillip Rivers has found his confidence. He's calling shit out before it happens, apparently, on the sidelines against the Cowboys. He was calling all kinds of plays out before they happened. He knew all the coverages, so he shouldn't have a problem against the Browns. 35-17 to 17 Chargers over the Browns. Cardinals, Rams, hey, more playoff implications. Cardinals were pretty tricky last week beating the Jaguars. That was a surprising, surprising upset. Uh, everybody was picking the Jaguars. Nobody thought the Cardinals could do it, but they did it. But can they do it two weeks in a row by upsetting the Rams? Now, a lot of people are picking them to. I'm not. I'm going with the Rams here. They did a great job against the Saints last week. Sean McVay's only getting better every week. Goff really has been showing some great accuracy uh, they need to figure out the play calling a little bit uh, going forward. In the playoffs, it's going to be an issue. But for now, I think the Rams are going to do just fine against the Cardinals on the road. I give them the win. I'm going to say 42 to 21. I'm going to say it's a big kind of a blowout. The Cardinals start getting some points at the end. They contain Larry Fitzgerald in the first time they met. So if they can do that again, they shouldn't have a hard time beating them. Todd Gurley is going to get the ball running. Adrian Peterson uh, will get shut down for the most part. 42-21 Rams over the Cardinals. Giants in Oakland. Geno Smith for the Giants. They got to travel to Oakland. Ben Macapupu's losing his team. The locker room's imploding. Uh, Snacks Harrison's on Twitter calling out Carl Banks, a legendary giant. Things are falling apart. Derek Carr, even without receivers, will do what he needs to do to win the game. Marshawn Lynch will probably get the rock a bunch. You know, it's an easy pick for me. I'm going to give the Raiders over the Giants. The Giants just aren't a team doing anything. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen for them going forward into next season. Odell Beckham, is he going to flip out and want to like leave the Giants? Maybe, probably. To be honest, I think he's next. So, but anyways, Oakland 24, Giants 10. Geno Smith's going to get sacked. He's going to get picked. Even if Oakland's the worst pass defense in the league, Geno Smith's still throwing a pick. Bet on it. Bet 100 bucks. Geno Smith throws a pick. Pay me uh, when I see you next week. Eagles, Seahawks. This should be fiery. This should be fiery because Seattle's playing at home. You know, their defense has lost a lot of personnel. They can still stop the run game pretty well. But the Eagles are just going to be too much for the Seahawks. Russell Wilson's going to be able to beat the Eagles secondary. He will. He should have a pretty good game fantasy point-wise. But, uh, yeah, the Eagles are tough right now. I give it to him 24 to 17. It's going to be kind of close. It's going to be one of those games where the score's close, but the game really isn't. Like, the Eagles kind of dominate the game, but for some reason the Seahawks are still, like, just there because that's what Russell does. But I'm going to give it to the Eagles, 24-17. And then the Monday night game. I'm seeing some picks for the Bengals here. Could the Bengals upset the Steelers at home? Based on the way that they played last week, I don't like those odds. I don't think that Andy Dalton can do as well as, you know, say, Brett Hundley did last week, which is kind of crazy to think about. But, you know, then again, if the Steelers, they get into these trap games where they're supposed to win it outright and then they don't. And that was kind of the situation last week with Green Bay. So that's why people are picking the Bengals. They're thinking, well, you know, the way the Steelers played Green Bay last week, you know, for sure Andy Dalton can throw better than Brett Hundley. I don't think so. I don't. And I'm going to give the Steelers the pick here. I think they found momentum. They've got a nice chemistry, even after the debacle that they had with Martavis Bryant and uh, Juju Smith-Schuster. Schuster should be back this week. Uh, Martavis Bryant's still going to be out on the field. He can't catch anymore. He, he caught that one touchdown, but there was a lot of drops I saw. Uh, so we'll see what happens next week. But I, I'm going to give the Steelers the win here. I just It's tough for me to pick the Bengals right now. I think they're on the way down, and I think Marvin Lewis needs to go. And quite honestly, it's like, what are you doing with A.J. McCarron? Or maybe we should evaluate him at this point. Maybe, maybe after this week, if they lose and they're kind of out of playoff contention, then maybe we get McCarron out there and see what we got. But Marvin Lewis needs to go. And the Bengals really shouldn't have got rid of Zimmer. Maybe they should have made him the head coach because look what he's doing with the Vikings. Yeah, but this is what you get when you stick with Marvin Lewis. So uh, that's what you got. That's what you get. That's what you, hey, you deserve it. 31-28 uh, Steelers over the Bengals. Maybe it's a shootout. 
So those are the game picks for week 13. Hey, we were 14 and two last week. Hopefully we repeat that this week. Yeah, I don't know. There was some tough ones. You know, the upset with the Jets and the Kansas City Chiefs, that's an interesting one. The Bills and the Patriots is an interesting one to watch because I'm not saying it's impossible for the Bills to upset the Patriots, you know, at home. They've done it before. Uh, we'll have to see, though. Redskins, Cowboys, another interesting one because, uh, hey, are the Cowboys going to find it or not? I really don't think they will. So anyways, those are the game picks for week 13. Fantasy lineup. Oh, you want the locks. Okay. My locks for this week are, and I'm not going to pick any big teams. I'm going to, I'll try to, I'll, I'll say, I'll say that the locks for this week are the Chargers because we haven't used them a lot. I know you haven't used them. Um, I'll say that the Raiders are a lock against the Giants, which is, that's risky. The Eagles are a lock. That's kind of a big team, but, and, uh, yeah, that's about all I can get. And maybe, maybe the Packers. If you're really getting down to the nitty-gritty with survivor picks, maybe picking the Packers or, or even the Niners, you know, because if you've used the Patriots and the Jaguars and the Vikings and everything like that up, you could even go with the Redskins too. So those are some lock picks. Tell your boss I said, what's up? Fantasy lineups this week. What do we got for the weekly fantasy lineup? Hopefully we can get some points and get some money. I've been doing terrible at the lineups, probably because I'm spending a lot of energy on the game picks. But I won't quit. I won't quit. I won't stop. You're lucky to have me. So here's the lineup I have this week. At quarterback, I'm going with Drew Brees. And I'm stacking him with Michael Thomas. Because Cam's playing better. This will be a shootout. Cam's going to run. He's going to put the points on the board. Which means Brees is going to have to put the points on the board. Nobody scares me on the Panthers defense in the back end. I think Drew Brees has a big day. Michael Thomas is a stack there. Going Drew Brees and Michael Thomas. You know? It was the best. The quarterbacks were tough this week. You could have paid up for Brady because he could be dominate. He could be dominant against the Bills. You could you could have paid up for Brady. Uh, you maybe could have gone Phil Rivers over the Browns defense, but I feel like that's kind of a trap. The Browns defense isn't isn't quite as terrible as everybody would make it out to be, even though their team's 0-10. The defense still, you know, I don't think Rivers is going to carve them up that bad. I could be wrong about that. But I, I went with Drew Brees. He was cheaper. Uh, then Tom Brady in the <sighs> at his price he was good I liked it I went with him and Michael Thomas and then my other receivers are Emmanuel Sanders and Corey Coleman because Corey Coleman could have had a touchdown last week he would have had a great week and at his at the price that they're selling him pff, I'll take it because I feel like he can get a touchdown this week he's been this close to getting one I like Coleman here Trevor Simeon coming back for the Broncos against a bad Oakland pass defense Oakland running up the score yeah, I feel like you know DT's gonna get the focus and Emmanuel Sanders can break off for a couple big plays at the price it's great so I'm gonna take Emmanuel Sanders there so I'm, I'm paying low for the wide receivers for the most part but here's where I chunk up I'm getting Gurley I'm getting Howard Jordan Howard I'm getting Jamal Williams I like all those three running backs. I think they're all, they'll all do good. Williams should have a good day against Tampa. Howard against the Niners run defense. Niners run defense isn't good. It isn't good. And they'll want to control that game. Um, and Todd Gurley, he's just been killing it every week. He wasn't so hot against the Vikings, but he was good last week, and he's going to be good this week again against the Cardinals, who don't have a bad run defense, but I just feel like, you know, Gurley's a good flex play there when I compare it. I wanted to kind of go Kamara, but with Luke Keekley out there, I think, you know, those guys' points come down a little bit. I didn't want to pay up that high. Fucking Alvin Kamara is like 8,800 or 8,100 or something. It's crazy. So I paid down a little bit. I got Gurley. And then at tight end, I'm going to put Safarian Jenkins in because dude's been close to getting a touchdown so many times. He's bound to get one this week against Kansas City. I think he finds a touchdown or two, and he should have a good day at the price. Yeah, I didn't want to pay up for Gronk or any of these guys. I, when I feel like Jenkins had a good value, could score and just as well as Gronk this week. He's been this close to getting a touchdown so many times this year. Him and Coleman, both on the verge of getting a you know, touchdown in a big day. Um, and then Chargers defense against the Browns. Because I, you could pay up and play Jacksonville against the Colts, and they could get a lot of sacks because people have been getting a lot of sacks on Jacoby Brissett. But... I'll pay down just a little bit, extra 500, uh, I'll save an extra 500, and I'll get the Chargers defense, who I think should also have a pick, fumble recovery, and a big day against the Browns. So there's the lineup. Breeze, Howard, Williams, Michael Thomas, Stack, Emmanuel Sanders, Coleman, Safarian Jenkins, Todd Gurley, Chargers D. Hey, I fucking, uh, I'm just desperate at this point. I'm just throwing shit out. Uh, you know, and I'm winning money. I'm doing a lot of lineups. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll put money in and I'll do a bunch of different lineups, a bunch of different looks. Last week, I had looks of Mariota. I had looks of uh, fucking, uh, I don't know. I had a bunch of different looks. 
so this is just one lineup that I've got going on. We'll see how it does for you. Hopefully we get some money. Hopefully we, you know, get some success. And I've got to figure this out by next year. I've really got to figure out the fantasy lineups. I've got to do a better job. Hey, some, some years you're just off. Hey, I'm just trying to coach it up. So it is what it is. And that's, uh, that's all I got for today. That's all I got for this week. Week 13, some playoff implications. I gave you the game picks. Uh, we talked about conspiracies. Uh, we talked about the zone run, the power run. Did some football 101. Talked about the sad tale of Eli Manning and how his days in New York are pretty much done. And uh, so, yeah, we got a lot covered this week. We look forward to next week where we break down our game picks and see how well we did or how well we didn't do. Um, check out Rowdy and the Piff on Mondays. Hey, we're on Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, the iTunes podcast app. You need to review. You need to review. We're, you know, it's important that you review. I need to make a living here. So review the show. Review it. That's all you got to do. Like, subscribe, comment. Hit, a, hit us up on Twitter, on the Twitter, at Rowdy Piff Pod or at Monster Piff. If you want to get at me directly, you got Piff on the Blitz questions, you, you got fantasy lineup questions, advice, whatever. Hit me up on the Twitter, at Rowdy Piff Pod or at Monster Piff. And that's all I got for today. And until next week, out. Yo, where the way at? Before I ran up in the building, talking way back. I stay late night, dreaming about the payback. All I want to do is get rich, hey, hey, yeah, yo. I get looking for a lick, hey, hey, yeah, yo. About to rob him for the shit, hey, hey, yeah, yeah, yo. Want the probe on the wrist, hey, hey, yeah, yeah. All I want to do is get rich, hey, yeah, yeah. Now where the hate at? I'm feeling next up.